So welcome everyone, welcome to this next session. The session uh, is on an energy, it's on uh, powering our net zero energy future. And to get us kick started, I'd like to introduce, uh, to bring up uh, Kerry Hayes. Kerry is at Regen, she's an ex-graduate of the University of Plymouth. And if I bring Kerry up, um, she can take us away. Thank you. Hi, Kerry. Hi, Ian. Thanks very much for that. Just bring my slides up and hopefully this will work seamless, seamlessly, rather. Can you now see my slides? Is that there? I'm going to assume yes. Um, yes, yes, <laughs> we can see. <laughs> Slightly disconcerting, I can't see anyone now, so that's that's great. Um, so thanks very much for that intro, Ian. As you say, I am a graduate from Plymouth University. I did both my undergraduate in ocean science and then my master's in marine renewables at Plymouth. So very happy to be back here speaking today. Um, I work for Regen, who are an organisation based in uh, the southwest of England, but we work across the UK and we have a mission. We're a, a not-for-profit organisation with a mission to accelerate the transformation to a zero, zero carbon future through um, supporting the development of decarbonised energy systems um, that are more democratic and um, far more decentralised than they currently are. So I'm just going to talk a little bit today about the energy mix that we're going to require in order to get to net zero and, and how we might go about getting there, because I'm sure it will come as no surprise to anyone that the, the answer to that question essentially is we need a lot more renewable energy. So I'm going to talk through um, sort of where we are now and, and what we need to do, uh, what we need to get to and sort of highlight some of the key things that need to be done in order to actually facilitate that transformation. So I will get started. So this slide here, I've taken this straight from the National Grid Future Energy Scenario. So um, it's a little bit complicated to see what's going on here, but over on the left-hand side, we've got the installed capacity of the energy mix from um, across up to the end of 2019. So there's a little bit of lag in the data. And as you can see there, um, it shows that fossil fuels and, and coal make up in about half, slightly more than half of that mix with renewable energy and, and other sources, including interconnectors and others, taking the remaining portion of that. And if you look to the middle of that diagram, uh, by 2030, National Grid's future energy scenario suggests that in these four scenarios, and you can kind of discount the final one, which is steady progression, because that's a non-legally uh, non binding um, scenario. It doesn't get us to the legally binding targets, by that I mean you can see that that coal um, aspect is, is decreasing and you'll see that not only is the amount of electricity generation increasing above that line, the vast majority of it becomes made up of solar and wind. They are the, the largest proportions of, of that extra. So offshore wind is shown there in the darkest green. Um, solar is uh, of course the orangey kind of yellowy color um, and then other renewables are also in there to include things like hydro and um, marine energy. And then if you were to look across to 2050, you'll see again, that's massively increased. It's almost quadrupled by, um, by, by the time we get there. Again, please ignore the last column. But if you look at the, the ones labeled CT, um, which is consumer transformation, and ST, which is um, steady uh, system transformation, rather, you can see again that renewable energy portion is getting much bigger. And the fossil fuel part of that is, is almost exact, is, no, is zero by the time we get there. So as you can see, we've got a huge increase in electricity generated by renewable sources coming. Um, and it's just worth noting that given this is generation, this doesn't include any of the um, electricity storage assets that we're going to need by this time. And if my next slide will come up. And I wanted to bring this slide up. So this was hot off the press from yesterday, and I'm sure it's been covered already in, in, the, in yesterday's event. Yesterday, the Committee on Climate Change gave their annual report to Parliament, and I picked out a few key stats here that I think are quite interesting. Um, so the top one there shows that in 2020, the amount of variable renewable energy that was installed in our system um, was only 0.8 of a gigawatt, and almost half of that, I think maybe even slightly more of than half, was offshore wind. Um, as you can see there in that top quote, and these are lifted directly from the report, that's significantly less than in previous years. We have been averaging um, almost four gigawatts a year for the last five years. Um, it is predicted that that slowdown is temporary, but I think it's worth focusing slightly on that, that we didn't get anywhere near where we'd need to get to last year. There are obvious reasons for that with the pandemic, but we are still getting closer to 2030 with every year. So although they do think it's going to be temporary, we've now almost got a 
um, an extra load to do in the next couple of years to make up that down that shortfall from from last year. Um, and when you look at the second bullet point and the third, which are closely linked, so low carbon generation increased by five percent. So we installed slightly less, but because of the lower overall demand, the amount of low carbon generation did increase by five percent, um, which therefore meant that it made up sixty two percent of our total electricity generation, which is up fifty seven percent from the previous year. So that's you know pretty impressive actually to do with the fact that we had lower demand, but it does show that renewable energy is becoming now the dominant source of electricity on, on our system, as evidenced by that final point there. So fossil fuel generation did decrease by 17% in 2020, which was the largest percentage fall um, in the last 20 years. And I've got this slide here. So it's the sixth carbon budget published by the Committee on Climate Change. The recommendation from that was adopted by the government earlier this year. So that was the, um, the big announcement that we need to cut emissions by 78% by 2035 on 1990 levels. And my colleague Joel at Regen at the time produced this graphic, which I think is pretty, um, pretty good to show sort of where we need to get to and how we need to generate much more electri uh, electricity by renewable sources to even get there. So if you look at on the left hand side, you can see there that renewable electricity generation needs to quadruple by 2035 in order to get there. So from where we are today, we need to do four times as much renewable electricity generation to even get close to that. That means that we're going to need to increase the targets for offshore wind, for example, from say 35 to 45 gig. We're gonna need another 32 gig of new solar PV. We're gonna need about another 18 gig of new onshore wind, and then increase that one gigawatt up to four for things like hydro wave and tidal power. And that's in order to fully get to that decarbonization point that we need to get to. So I've put this slide in here just to illustrate that we've got these sort of, we know now that the evidence is there, that the science is there, we need to decarbonise our systems. The Committee on Climate Change have come out very strongly there and the government has taken their advice. But we need, in order to get there, we need some good, strong policy, we need some actions to do so. So the long-awaited energy white paper came out at the end of last year, which shortly which came shortly after the 10-point plan for a green industrial revolution, which you can see there on the left. and. It was a great start and the paper is lengthy, it covers lots of ground, but many of the announcements that were in there were not new and there was very little decisive action that will not require lots of lengthy consultation periods in order to help us achieve these goals. So it's a reason to be positive that we had the paper, but we now need the, po the policies that are going to follow on in order to seriously get us where we need to get to. Um, lots of the policies or the announcements rather that came out in that paper only focused on things like offshore wind and it's probably symbolic that offshore wind is on the front of that paper but we know that we need um, significant actions to reduce barriers to things like onshore wind and solar if we're going to actually get anywhere near where we need to get to. Right, slide stopped. Just having some technical difficulties, hang on. Uh, give me one moment. I've had a bit of a malfunction. One second. Okay, that's fine. Don't worry. <laughs> it's because of the enormity of the energy challenge. That's what it's that's it. it's just, <laughs> I'm having some energy challenges myself, clearly. Um, let's see if that's up now. Oh, it's gone back to the beginning. Sorry, bear with me. Oh, well, that's fine. Just back through, yeah. There we go. Perfect. Okay. There we go. So I sort of just before we get to some more of those actions um, to break down one of the graphics I showed you before. Um, this is the National Grid Fair's consumer transformation scenario. So it's pretty much the most ambitious of all of them. And this just I think is really indicative of, of where we're going out over the next sort of 25 years, nearly 30 years rather. So as you can see there, we've got that big dropping off of coal. You'll see that gas remains pretty um, pretty steady in there. No, that's not on this one. <laughs> You'll see that um, on offshore wind is increasing significantly out to 2030, while other renewables continue to make that make that um, increase. And, and crucially, the overall uh, generation is increasing massively. Um, 
And as I've just pointed out, we've, we've got these sort of overarching papers that are supposed to set the way, but we're missing a whole load of actions. So I wanted to just bring up my final slide in order to focus on some of those actions that I think are really important, which... Focusing on some of the actions that we need to do then. So Regen is calling, along with many others um, in, the, in the sector, for a whole bunch of actions to actually enable us to meet any of these targets. So I guess I kind of want to focus a minute on some of my wish list items to get us to where we get to. So we would like um, sustainable long-term um, funding mechanisms or income streams for large-scale renewables. So that will need that will mean we need to see improvements to the contracts for difference process. So bringing that forward to at least annual auction rounds. Um, we need to end the onshore wind ban because we know that wind energy is now the cheapest form of electricity generation. So there's been a sort of um, effective ban on onshore wind for a number of years, which, which needs to be lifted. We need to facilitate the development of flexible smart energy systems, energy systems dominated by renewable energy. Well, they're absolutely what we need to do. They are going to prove challenging for us, our uh, system. So we need to make sure that storage and flexibility markets are facilitated and, and brought online at the same time as all of these renewable schemes. We need um, to enable network operators and others to invest ahead of need to improve the electricity networks to allow all of this generation to be to be held on that grid. And that's at both a transmission and a distribution level. It, crucially, we need to focus a bit on that hard to decarbonize sector or sectors rather, um, because they are largely going to end up being, um, if, sorry, if we look to things like heat and transport and some of the hard to decarbonize sectors, such as some of the industrial and commercial sectors, we know that we're gonna have to um, electrify them, but we're gonna have to find a way to do that. So for example, with heat, we're gonna have to find a way to, de to incentivize those householders and others to make the transition, to move away from fossil fuels and speaking of fossil fuels, we need to bring forward the ban and we need to do as we've done with the electric with electric vehicles. So by putting a ban on um, non-electric vehicles um, or traditional vehicles, that's stimulating a market. We need to do exactly the same thing with heat in order to stimulate the, um, the sort of heat pump market and to get the costs down and increase the amount that are deployed. Um, we need to speed up when we're thinking about things like offshore wind. The process around leases needs to be sped up in order to hit that huge target for offshore wind that we've got by 2030, by 2035 and by 2050. So leasing needs to become much more straightforward and, and speedy. And we need... I completely lost my train of thought, sorry. Um, and speaking of that target for re offshore renewables, I think we need, or offshore wind rather, we need much more ambitious targets for other renewable energy sources. When we have targets that gives the market something to work towards, um, it allows people to increase the, um, the supply of the kit, the supply chain to get ready. And we need to do all of these things all at the same time in order to try and get us to that sort of fair, equitable energy system, which is much more low carbon. So that's everything I wanted to say for today. So I'll, uh, I'll leave Fantastic. it there. Thanks, Kerry. There's loads of comments, loads of discussion in the in discussion thread. We'll keep the questions to the Q and A at the end, so we'll crack on. But you you have kind of teed up very nicely our next speaker. So if I can bring up Professor Deborah Greaves, who will be talking about the offshore realm in particular, which Deborah's is leading on. Deborah, please take it away. Okay. Thanks very much, Ian, and thank you, Kerry, because certainly you have uh, put things very nicely in context uh, for what I want to talk about today. Um, right, so the screen is sharing, that's great. So I'd like to talk to you about the Supergen Offshore Renewable Energy Hub, um, which is a, a large programme of research and its role in trying to support um, development of the technologies and how they can be used in order to get towards this net zero uh, future. So Kerry talked a bit about uh, the targets we have and the aspirations for offshore wind in particular. But the Supergen Offshore Renewable Energy is an academic um, uh, research program um, that is funded through the uh, EPSRC, that's the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. And the aim of the hub is to, to bring people together, to bring the researchers together, to connect together academia with industry, policymakers, and public stakeholders uh, in order to inspire innovation 
uh, to help support the acceleration of uh, offshore renewable energy and the understanding around it uh, in order to tackle those the, the huge challenge that we all face. And uh, we want to, through the, the development of offshore renewable energy, to maximise the societal value uh, in offshore wind, wave energy and tidal stream energy. So the hub is a sort of has a sort of research leadership role, if you like, uh, bringing together the, the community and connecting uh, the research with practice to make sure that uh, we can translate our, our, our research into practice and also that it's directed in the right way. And we have an opportunity to influence policy as well and make sure that, um, that things are supported in the right way or to try to encourage them to be. Um, so we see this leadership role sort of very much in terms of inspiring the research and connecting together the people that need to uh, to steer the, the research and also to then implement the findings of the research. But alongside the <clears throat> excuse me the inspire role, we also have a role in helping to uh, make sure that we have a sustainable community of people working in these areas. So helping to train uh, the future workforce. And, uh, and to make it sustainable. And one key part of that is equality, diversity and inclusion. And we have a, a particular sort of strategy around that um, and also supporting the development of our early career researchers. And within the research also, we, we it's engineering and physical sciences, but we're taking a whole system approach. So we're not just thinking about the, the individual technology, but how it connects into the grid, how it's used in the, in the grid, how it uh, interacts with its environment um, and also how it's going to be uh, used by society um, in the future. So we cover within the offshore renewable energy hub, wave energy, offshore wind and tidal stream energy. Uh, these are at very stages, very different stages of development. So in offshore wind, we've seen huge commercial rollout. Uh, it's Number one, I think, of the, of the government's 10-point plan at the moment, so massive aspiration for uh, offshore wind. We've seen the price reduced by uh, over 50% over the last couple of years. Um, but in order to get to uh, the, well, the targets, so um, as Kerry said, we've got, well, it started off as 30 gigawatts by 2030. That's been increased to 40 gigawatts. It's possible that we'll need... Uh, 100 to maybe 140 gigawatts by 2050 in order to uh, achieve our net zero target. Um, so that's massive. And we're probably going to need not just fixed offshore wind turbines, but floating structures as well. That means going into deeper water further offshore, and it means development of new technology. So that's uh, new innovation. Um, and then also wave energy and tidal stream energy are at very different stages of commercial development. Uh, we've seen some full-scale demonstration of uh, tidal stream and in uh, in wave energy we've seen some demonstrations but you know really still there are a, a large number of different design concepts and, and quite a lot of uh, significant de design challenges remain in order to get the cost reduction we need for, for, for wave energy so they're at very different stages of development but our supergen hub aims to uh, carry out research, inspire research to target the, uh, the innovations needed to, to, to suit each area. This is the team. I, I've just got um, the, the map there of the UK showing where the different uh, co-directors for the Supergen Hub are based. Uh, it's led from Plymouth. It's a nine million pound program over four years. And um, uh, we have expertise uh, across the UK and across the, the disciplines um, shown here. And we've got 10 different universities involved as co-directors, um, but we have a much larger network of universities as well. Uh, we're supported by a very strong uh, industry and um, uh, government and other, uh, other stakeholders sort of representation in our industry advisory board and the logos of those are sort of shown on the right hand side of the slide there and they're an independent group that work with us uh, challenge what we're doing but also work with us on, on what we're doing within different initiatives so really important um, i'm just showing a couple of slides to show this the international reach of this is just the co-directors so it doesn't sort of represent the whole uh, community 
But just to show you how this is a, a really important uh, global um, activity, many countries are, are, are developing offshore renewables. So these are collaborations, and this one looks at the citations uh, globally. OK, so um, I'd like to show you a little bit more about how we try to communicate the, the activities that we have. And one of our key tools is, is the research landscape. And that is a, a web tool which helps to uh, sort of summarize the research challenges and um, themes. So this is a little movie to talk you through the research landscape. And uh, you can find it through our website. You can click at the top, then you click on the, button at the bottom, and you get into the re research landscape. And this is an a, a, um, interactive uh, web tool which tries to illustrate the environment you can see some floating offshore wind turbines, some fixed ones, some tidal stream turbines at the bottom, and some wave energy devices. Uh, then we have uh, eight themes, and within each theme, there are a number of research challenges that have been identified. If you click the button, um, then they appear around the, the landscape. If you click on one of those, then you'll get some more information about that research challenge. And we've got some um, sort of high level information, overview, context, and status. And then if you go further, you can click the delve deeper button and that will take you uh, down into more information and links through to individual research projects and uh, connections with um, things like the Carbon Trust and the Offshore Renewable Energy um, Catapult and their research priorities. So this is our, <coughs> our sort of tool for communicating and summarizing the research challenges. And those were all identified through uh, consultation with industry and with academics. So that's our research landscape. And then within the research landscape, we have a number of ways that we can uh, promote the research or carry out research. So we have a core research program. This is um, developed by the and carried out by the uh, core research uh, members, so the co-directors of the, of the team. And here, we designed this program to try and uh, address the particular challenges in each of the three sectors. So we're trying to work across the sectors of offshore wind, wave, and tidal, and look at the, the synergies between them and some of the common challenges, and, um, and then to carry out that research which will tackle those common challenges. So in the first work package, we're looking at uh, the different scenarios, uh, future scenarios for offshore renewable energy farms, what are the challenges, the technical challenges to get to those, and what are the GVA or the uh, gross value added benefits that might come out of those. Then in the second work package, we're setting up uh, information and data for sites and conditions. The idea is to have a set of sort of benchmark sites that the community can use and test their ideas against. In Work Package 3, we're looking at developing modeling tools. Uh, the modeling tools we use for design of devices and arrays uh, and, and farms are, um, are quite different. So when you're looking at different scales, then you can have a, a different levels of detail in your numerical model. And what we want to try and do is have those models to uh, all link together and to make sure that we're carrying the appropriate amount of physics from one of those models into the next, and then right up into the energy system models, which generate the sort of data that, that Kerry was showing earlier on in those, in those uh, energy system scenarios. Um, then we're also doing research looking at design, trying to see how we can improve the design, uh, look at new designs and design processes in order to reduce the cost and risk of these, uh, these new uh, machines, these new technologies, uh, and also uh, looking at the, uh, the different concepts, designs, and innovations for those floating structures. Um, so that's our core research program. And then that's also complemented by a very large um, program of flexible funding. So we've had, uh, we've run three rounds of flexible funding awards. These are um, projects of about 100,000 each. So we've funded 30 projects. We spent about three million pounds on those. We've just allocated the last, uh, the third uh, funding round. And with that work, we have um, two, about nearly two and a half million in industry match. So we're really looking for research which has got a strong pathway to, uh, to translation, to implementation, 
and so looking for teams to be working together uh, between academia and industry. Um, you can find out more about that on the website. There's some information here about our early career researcher network. We run a series of training events and activities and also some specific funding um, for the early career researchers. We work closely with uh, policy. We worked on a, a developing a wave energy roadmap to, to path the route to, to wave energy development. Um, that's then stimulated some funding going into research in wave energy. Uh, we've also launched a, a COP26 briefing recently. I mentioned our equality, diversity and inclusion work, and we have a particular line of work on this, supporting also the offshore winds um, uh, sector deal, which it aims for a third of the workforce to be uh, female by, by um, 2030. And there are, I'm doing a, a marketplace session on this. If you're interested, please do join that one uh, in a minute a bit later on. Uh, we, as part of that, do a, a range of outreach and engagement work. And um, we have also just launching a new MSc at Plymouth uh, in offshore renewable en engineering. And this also uh, is being run as a degree apprenticeship. Um, we have done a survey of facilities. We have lots of information on our website about facilities for offshore renewable energy research, which is and, and uh, commercial testing as well, available uh, on the website. You can find out more about each of those. And then just a quick shout out for our own facility, which is the Coast Laboratory, where we do some great uh, work. And we've just had investment in a new uh, wind generation system, which means we'll be able to do some uh, more research really targeted at uh, floating offshore wind. Um, design and development. And here's just a movie to show an experiment going on in the lab. This is a, a wave energy device, a hinged raft, uh, and that's it um, interacting with a wave, uh, a design wave. And then on the right hand side is an example of a floating offshore wind turbine um, with an actuator on the top for the turbine so you can't see the blades. But this is uh, actually in the lab in the tank at the moment. Okay, so I think that's quarter two. That's me. There's some links uh, there and some uh, contact uh, ways to contact us. Please do do get in touch and look at the website. Thanks, Ian. Fantastic. Thanks, Deborah. And I'll bring up Kerry as well, and uh, we can have uh, start bringing some questions. I, um, I might ask a question that maybe overlaps with both of you. First of all, there's some specific things in the thread for one or the other, but but one's this notion of the balancing act between onshore and offshore. So um, I think it was Jenny, but someone said onshore wind seems to be much more cost effective. Shouldn't we be t putting more time and investment into changing government policy, which is something that, um, that Kerry mentioned. So, you know, where should we be putting the eggs in the, the basket in terms of the, the wind? Is it the inch onshore or is it the offshore? Maybe Kerry can start us off and then we could Deborah. Nope. We hear. Are you hearing me? You're hearing me. I can't hear you. So let me take you off. You seem to be. Looks like you're muted. Gone to my thing here. Can I unmute you? If I got the control. Deborah, can you start on that one? If you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> um, well, defend, obviously, defending the offshore as opposed to the onshore. Yeah, well, of course, I would say offshore is is where we have huge potential. I think you know one of the things we need to think about with our onshore wind turbine. The reason it's cheaper on onshore, of course, is it's easier to access and to maintain, and uh, we don't have the same challenges for for uh, installing and and, um, and constructing onshore as we do offshore um, but we have a challenge in in terms of space and also public perception of uh, onshore wind and so going offshore um, potentially much more space the quality of the wind is is better uh, in that it's not affected by uh, land buildings mountains and so on um, and uh, and, and yes, if we if we can go further offshore, then we get over some of the issues of, of public uh, perception and so on. 
Um, but I think the other thing we need to think about with onshore wind is that some of the wind turbines um, that were built you know, uh, in, the, in the 90s and so on are coming to the end of their life. So we do need to think about um, replacing them, repowering them, putting new turbines, replacing the turbines or replacing the whole structure. Mm. Yeah, it, a couple of people mentioned uh, that NIMBY, you know, that uh, social license issue on shore. In terms, some has also said, is there much community engagement that's going on within the Supergen project with local kind of coastal communities? Because this could be quite transformative in the long term for them. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that, that that's definitely something that's been um, identified as the as a as a real uh, important part in in offshore renewable energy development generally, and where uh, communities and local stakeholders have been engaged early in the development of demonstration projects or wider projects that makes a huge difference. Uh, we certainly found that uh, back in the the Sofia project that we ran a few years ago. There's a couple of technical questions, so we're still struggling to get Kerry back. So if I can ask them, I mean, I think John Pope's asked a couple. Um, they're a, a kind of a, a, a regular occurrence is the intermittency uh, problem with renewable. He says, how do you see us solving that problem? Uh, well, I think with the intermittency uh, issue, then, you know, one really important thing for, for renewables is is to understand their different characteristics and that can be um, seen as intermittency but also I think the very the, the different characteristics of renewables can be um, an advantage if we can bring them together so a combination of solar wind um, and tidal and wave can a diverse energy mix uh, can give us real resilience and uh, can be used well I think the other th the other important component of course is storage the role of storage within the, the system and certainly that's uh, um, something that's getting quite a lot of attention at the moment and for example looking at where uh, air compressibility uh, compression storage or hydrogen or ammonia or other energy vectors sort of fit within the within the system i think Kerry, has got, Kerry, got you back Yes, yeah, about intermittency. Yeah. My computer well, thought it would have a go at <laughs> intermittency. <laughs> so we, we started off talking about this. This uh, it's not really a conflict between onshore and offshore, but it certainly can be in people's minds. In terms of the onshore, you mentioned the idea of trying to reverse government policy uh, mm. on that. Can you say a little bit more about that social license thing, particularly in the southwest context? Yeah, I think it's really important, as you say, particularly in the southwest and. Um, we've got fantastic wind resources down here, but there has been this um, often perceived negativity towards onshore wind. And, and I say perceived because all of the Bay's attitude trackers for the last, gosh, I don't know how many years, have actually shown that people are not as negative about onshore wind as, as we'd be perhaps made to believe by some of the more I don't know, right wing media. So I think there is a little bit more appetite towards it by people than, than we would be led to believe. Um, but many government a couple of governments ago they sort of put in the effective ban on onshore wind that by saying that only um local authorities that had wind identified in their local plans could could go ahead and do that so it has been a real problem plus then not having the contracts for difference mechanism for quite some time for onshore wind so it, it really does need changing because we have got these massive targets and, and they're not targets for targets sake we, we have to get to net zero and we've got this resource that we need to we need to exploit um in order to to, to get there but also to realize the benefits for people so but onshore and offshore wind the, the big difference as far as I can see it is the scale so offshore wind is huge and predominantly comes into the uh, transmission network and, and the opportunity for real community benefits is perhaps less whereas onshore wind at a, a smaller scale but built in people's communities does have some of that opportunity for um, very tangible jobs in those communities and the economic benefits um, can really be spent within the borders or realised within the borders of, of the county in which they're generated. So I think there's definitely a need for both offshore and onshore wind, and we need to do all we can to facilitate both. Well, on that facilitation point, it might be worthwhile mentioning the Devon Climate Assembly, mm. which started this week, and which one of the mm. questions is exactly on onshore wind, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, that's exactly right. I'm speaking about that on Sunday, in fact. Um, 
exactly that is to, to try and make sure that we can get onshore wind into that plan and and to um explain some of those benefits to people that maybe they don't realize and, and just sort of see these turbines but don't really understand all of those extra benefits as well as as clean electricity for people and, and there's a question from alan ramage on about and again this is i think for both of you the disconnect between rhetoric and reality by government mm -hmm. the, this, he says the reality is stark. I'm tempted to say the the reality at the moment is Chris Stark calling out the UK. The UK yeah. seems to be calling out the government yesterday on this. From both sides, from both of you, maybe start with Kerry. What do you need from government to then start implementing things at the local or the regional level? Oh, what don't we need from government to start doing that? <laughs> I think some really helpful policies. I think that I think it's a fair criticism that there's a lot of rhetoric and. And that needs to be turned into real action. So we need access to stable mechanisms um, for funding or for, you know, to develop those business models. We need um, access to, to the grid. I think that's, that's really important. We need to be able to actually get these projects into the system, which means government needs to allow network operators to do the investment that's required. I think that's really critical, opening up those, those grids. There's no, you know, we know how to do this stuff now. We know how to do onshore wind. We know how to do offshore wind. We know how to do solar. There are still technologies that are in R&D stage, but those three that I've just mentioned are absolutely not. We know how to do it. The industry just needs those signals to go ahead and get on with it. And they need for that, they need market mechanisms, they need access to grid, planning to not be at such a barrier and systems to just be a bit more straightforward. And, and Deborah, for you, for the offshore realm, are there asperities there? Yeah, well, I think, um, I think, it was mentioned earlier on, but the idea of setting a target for wave and tidal would be really important um, because I think we need to show we need to, to understand that they also need to be developed uh, in in order for us to have you know the the, the right and diverse and the the amount of um, uh, renewables um, by the time it gets twenty fifty, um, and then I think that. You know, obviously, I would say we need to to maintain the um, the research. We need to understand that although we can set these targets and offshore wind is is high in the government's ten point plan, the new technology needed um, in order to deliver that, and uh, the understanding that we need to develop in order to deliver that, deliver that is still pretty enormous. I mean, I, I mentioned floating offshore wind as the new technology. Um, you know, there are a lot of questions around the right solution for that and uh, whether there might be different solutions in different situations, of course, in different parts of the world. Um, but also, uh, it's, it, the, the expansion is absolutely phenomenal. And so to try and understand uh, what the environmental interactions like to be on a, on a sort of population level and on a cumulative, cumulative level is, mm. uh, is also yeah. really important. Um, if we're going to get that number of projects built out over the next uh, 15, 20, 30 years, uh, then we do need to uh, speed up the consenting process. But in order to do that, we need to have a lot more knowledge of the, um, uh, you know, the, the impact on the ecosystem as well. Well, I was just going to finish with that, Deborah, because there's been several questions, maybe you've seen them yourself, about marine life, biodiversity, effects on cetaceans, etc. Can you say a little bit about the, are things happens within the Supergen project to look at that, particularly with offshore wind? Yes, we do have um, that within our remit. It's, it's, it's uh, most, of the, most of the focus is on the engineering and physical side, um, but we do have uh, Beth Scott, who's our... our, our um, ecosystem, the marine ecosystems expert. And I'm very pleased to say also that this is something that's being funded more, um, this area is being funded more and a, a very, um, from NERC and also very much on the agenda for the Crown Estate at the moment. So I think the idea of the understanding of the significant increase in, in uh, very large scale offshore wind that we're going to need um, goes with it the the understanding that we need to really understand its effect on population level so we do know quite a bit already from um interactions with marine life in terms of um individuals and sound interactions and so on but i think there's another there's another sort of scale to get to um the the impact that might be um a, as a result of the very large scale offshore offshore wind so yeah more research is needed there Fantastic. Maybe one, Kerry, will you want to come in on that? 
Um, it was, I wanted to come in on a slightly different point, just if that's okay. Yeah. If that's yeah. um, I've spotted a, a couple through the, um, while I was speaking, there's a couple of points that have come up about energy efficiency and, and reducing demand. And I, um, I, I've sort of failed in my presentation to actually mention that. I think it's important to address that that is um, absolutely critical. And I didn't focus on it too much, given I was mainly focusing on generation and, and supply. But I think it is something that comes up every time I do one of these presentations that, um, increasing energy efficiency in our homes um it kind of goes without saying now we we've got a huge way to go on that and it's, it's the next big challenge the heat and building strategy is due out from government soon and that's going to be really critical um to getting us there um and but in in all seriousness even when we reduce the demand in our homes we are still going to need more electricity because that demand is going to be met by electrify uh, by through electrification so just didn't want to leave that as a an unset through the comment it is absolutely no, I had that noted down, but and as you make the point, the electrification agenda means our energy demand is going to go up, and actually bringing the domestic stuff down is really going to be absolutely critical. Yeah, and I, yeah, finish your thought. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, and, and there's this debate that rages on around whether or not we'll go for hydrogen or whether it'll be heat pumps. And again, I, for hydrogen to be genuinely green and therefore actually meet the low carbon, it needs to be generated through electrolysis, and we need to be using clean electricity. So basically whichever way you slice it we need more renewables <laughs> it's the sort of sum up i guess well that's a really useful point to finish on we do need more renewables and the question is how the best way to get there and i think certainly projects like the supergen are that multifaceted projects is a fantastic way for academia to be doing that and it's great to see people like yourself carry at region trying to look at the policy and the government interface the aspect too so thank you both very much for joining us today um, it's been a really good session. I think there's going to be a discussion board on this, so if people want to transfer across and to continue that discussion. I think I saw Kirsty putting some web links up to your Supergen page with the, the landscape. And so I think everyone should be fully informed now. <laughs> and I'll close the session. Thank you very much, Deborah. Thank you very much, Kerry. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks, thank you very much. much.